Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Hi, um, I'm very pleased to introduce Brian Pardo, who's going to talk to us today about crowdsourcing audio production interfaces. Brian was my colleague at Northwestern University. He's uh, involved in both computer science and music. Um, and he has a PhD in uh, one and a master's in the other from University of Michigan. He uh, does a lot of great research on uh, music and computing. And in his spare time, he's a professional musician. So thanks for joining us today. Thank you. OK, so I have just spent the last six months on sabbatical in London. And it was awesome, but it, the, it will explain the following three slides. I run the Interactive Audio Lab at Northwestern University. And Northwestern is in Chicago. And, and you guys being in Boston uh, probably need to be reminded as well, since in Europe, half the time, they're like, oh, Northeastern. I love North. No, no, not Northeastern. No, Northwest. Seattle. I love Seattle. No, not Seattle. Northwestern University in beautiful, sunny Chicago, Illinois. OK, so that's one way of locating me. Another way of locating me is that I do computer audition. And as she, she's rightfully pointed out, it's focused on music. Um, a lot of times, if you say computer audition to people, they go, oh, yeah, I know someone who does speech recognition. And speech recognition is to computer audition as optical character recognition is to computer vision, a very important subfield. There are others that we think are important, too. Um, and so some of the stuff that, that we do is at the intersection of things like crowdsourcing, music cognition, speech science. It's also at the intersection of machine learning, information retrieval, and signal processing. And somehow or another, I have to deal with all of these things to do what I do. And now I know you're here for, for the main event, which is talking about the crowdsourced audio production stuff. But if anyone's been to the movies lately, you don't actually, you paid for the movie, you want to see the movie, but you don't get the movie for the first 15 minutes, do you? It's trailers for other movies. And in that spirit, I'm just going to tell you a couple of quick things about other things that we do. One thing that, that I worked on is music search, which is solving the problem. I have a song stuck in my head, uh, but can't remember what it's called. And hopefully, our, our search engine will actually load in your, oh, great. And so it would go something like this. I, I remember it's a song. It's something like, hey, dude. Don't make me mad. Find this bad song. Make me feel better. So maybe I didn't get the lyrics quite right on that. Let's see. Hey, okay, dude. Okay, good. Recorded it. And then. You begin to make it. Those better. are the right lyrics. Okay. Not going to talk about that today. This is the commercial, in case some of you are meeting with me uh, later on in the week, and in case you want to talk about one of those things. That's one demo of stuff we do. So uh, information retrieval, and by the way, that uh, the, the database for that search engine was crowdsourced. If you go to tunebot.org and you sing it a song, you will help increase our search engine's ability. Uh, another thing I work on is audio source separation. That's where you have a mixture of sounds that are all together in a signal. And you would like to split them into parts that you would like to work on. Let's say, for example, you, you want to do karaoke or maybe something like speech recognition in a room full of other noises. Wouldn't it be great if you could just have one microphone record the whole party, and then home in on the, uh, the one conversation that you'd like to listen to. Wouldn't that be great for our friends at the NSA? Well, I prefer to think of the karaoke application. So I'm going to give you an example. Or 
or the deaf people example, hearing aids, wouldn't, you, wouldn't it be great if you could have a clicker that you could s change channels, you're trying to listen at a party, just listen to the person you want to listen to. Um, here's, here's a quick example of one kind of uh, source separation that we've been doing. So here's the original piece of audio. Maybe I wanted to do a karaoke version where I play my clarinet instead of them playing their clarinet. And so we just did a little source separation. And then I could play my part over. Uh, that again is not the focus of this talk, but if you want to talk to me about how we do that, I would love to. No, what I'm here to talk about is the following problem. I am, in fact, someone who, who makes music, and that music you heard was me. And if you couldn't tell, that was something that sort of old-timey sounds. Now, the problem is, it actually sounds too good. Modern recording stuff that you get sounds great. I want it to sound more like this. Like it's being played a over a little transistor radio or off of an old record, instead of like that. Now, I know what you're going to say. Well, OK, so play it off of a little transistor radio. Problem solved. But I am a technologist. And I make technology. And, and my first thought is to use all the high-tech tools at my disposal. So I go to the audio equivalent of Photoshop, which is called Pro Tools. And this is Pro Tools. And what you see here is a typical Pro Tools session, sort of mid-session. And displayed on here is a tool that will achieve this for me if only I pick the right one. Is anyone here confident that they know which tool that is? <laughs> Raise your hand if you are. OK, I'll help you out. Now it might be a little more obvious. Let's blow that guy up. This is a parametric equalizer. Parametric equalizers allow you to boost or lower different frequency components of audio. So you, if you want to boost what you think of as the low end, you turn one of these knobs. You boost the mid-range or the high end. You turn a different knob. And here we go. This is a typical tool included with a typical you know, industry standard uh, audio suite. And the first thing I think to myself is, where's the tinny knob? right? And of course, there isn't one. And most people I talk to are not actually audio people. They're visual people. And you've experienced this with Pro Tools, right? You have an idea in your head. You've got a clear idea of what you want to make. The problem is that's the interface you've been handed. And it is not so clear. Even if someone tells you the right tool, what on earth do I do with this to get the effect I'm looking for, right? Not clear. So one thing you do is you spend six months learning how to work Pro Tools. But one thing I would like to have happen is instead of you learning what the software means by parametric equalization, I want the software to learn what you mean by tinny. So wouldn't it be great if instead I go, it's too tinny, or it's not tinny enough? And it says, well, here's a tinny knob. Let's, let's deal with that. Well, of course, this brings up the issue of how do we get the machine to understand what I mean when I say tinny. It is not helpful to look up in a dictionary the definition for tinny, because that is not what you say. It, how you say? Uh, it is not anything actionable by a machine. It's, it, it'll say tinny, you know, metallic. Uh, and that doesn't tell us what frequency components to raise or lower or what to do. So what we do instead is we play a sound for you, and we say, OK, you want, I don't know what tinny means. Here's a sound. Now, I'm going to change different frequency components from the low to the high end. And if you see something raised, it means that frequency had its volume boosted. And if it's below the line, it means it was cut. Well, how tinny is that? You want to give me a, a rating? How about this? Or that? Essentially, it's 
dealing with you the way, you know, maybe your four-year-old child deals with you. Is that a dog? Yes, that's a dog. Is that a dog? Uh, no, that, that's, a, that's a cat. And then they show you like a, a Snoopy cartoon. Is that a dog? Well, sort of it's a dog. I mean, it's a cartoon of it. Stop asking so many questions, right? But that's the only way you really learn a definition. You've got to, you have to provide instances, ask how dog-like this is, or in this case, how tinny it is, and get some sort of idea of, from your teacher of how close that is to the mark of this concept we're trying to learn. And so what we're going to be doing here is we're going to be talking about machines that learn audio descriptors, adjectives, for describing sound qualities. And the only way they can really do that, really, is to play a sound and learn from you what you think of that sound in light of this descriptor. Now, we've already done this and, in fact, made an equalizer plugin that you can already download. This is, the student that, that first worked with me on this has since graduated and started a startup company. And he made this equalizer called IQ. And I don't know how clear it is, but here it says dislike and here it says like. Before we got on to the labeling words, we just wanted to get at the sound quality without worrying about the word label. And so it plays audio for you. And when you hear a sound, you, uh, you drag. The sound is associated with a little puck here that you drag back and forth to say, oh, that sounds pretty good. That doesn't sound pretty good. And each puck is associated with a different uh, equalization, a different mixing up of the sound to try and find out what qualities it is that influence you in your decision about what you think of it. And what you end up with is you end up with some kind of a controller. I was just teaching this. Where you make it more or less tinny based on something you just learned. And yeah, we'll come back to that later. Now, so so how this works, let me let me first describe to you what this all is. This is a representation of the amount that somebody is boosting or cutting something. I believe this was for the word warm. Somebody was teaching it their concept for warm, at different frequencies. Here's 125 hertz, that's low. And then here's like and higher than I can whistle. OK, so this is frequency. And this is how much we boost or cut a frequency. And this is the learned amount to boost or cut in order to grab a certain person's concept. Now, how did we decide how much to boost or cut? Well, we asked them lots of questions. We literally provided different EQ curves, like I said before, back here. All these different EQ curves. And we said, how much do you like that? And you give an answer. Oh, I like this one a lot. This one's pretty tinny. OK, great. If you think of each of the 40 bands, this is a 40 band equalization, each of the 40 channels as an independent thing. Now, we can discuss offline whether or not that's a good assumption. But let's pretend for the moment that it is. Each of the 40 channels then gets an amount we boosted it and what you thought of it. So a negative 0.8 plus up 15 dB for 125 hertz. A negative 0.8 plus down by about 15 dB for maybe around 1,000 hertz. Okay? These are two-dimensional points that we can put in a scatter plot the gain that we applied in any particular example, and the rating the person gave that example. So if we treat each frequency as its own independent thing, suddenly if I've rated 30 or so examples, I can do a scatter plot here and start to see a main effect for how much boosting or cutting that frequency seemed to affect how much you thought it was, for example, in this case, warm. And so if you do a simple linear regression. This is, this is the first approach we've done. We've tried smarter, or not smarter, we've tried more complicated things since, which aren't necessarily better. <laughs> if you get a positive slope, the amount of your, the angle of your slope tells us how much boosting seems to boost your liking of it. If you've got a negative slope, that tells us how much reducing the amplitude at that frequency seems to increase your liking of the example. And if you've got 
essentially nothing, then we neither boost nor cut. It's a very straightforward thing. And that goes ahead and makes this IQ equalizer. And I said it's been released. It's been released and reviewed and downloaded. And this is a nice thing. It does something I haven't seen before simply and well. It could help bridge the language gap between musicians and engineers in a non-combative way. One of the things that happens to musicians and engineers is they do speak different languages. And the musician will come in. And I was actually in a recording session where the violinist said, uh, I don't have the sheen on my violin sound that I'm looking for. Can you give it more of a sheen? And the engineer said, show me the sheen knob, and I will turn it. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, there was no sheen knob. And this would be a thing where you, the engineer could now say, you know what? Why don't you just try IQ, and I'll come back in a few minutes, and we'll see what we've got. We've had users try the, this in the lab, and we've asked them to teach it a set of words. And then what we did was we said, OK, teach it a word, and then we'll hand you a controller, and you play with the controller, and then you tell us how satisfied you are that it learned the concept you were after. And their ratings were between learned concept. These were things provided to them. They, the, their rating labels were learned concept perfectly, did not learn, learned the opposite concept. and. Uh, 35 people on these variety of words, they seem to be learning. Because we were in the Midwest, and Midwesterners are polite, and they want you to feel good, every time we did this, we gave them a randomly ordered pair. One was the controller that actually was learned on their data. Another was a controller learned on random responses, machine generated. And uh, this is the random response one. And you can see there's an actual bias here. Uh, of positivity on the part of, of Midwesterners. I don't know. I've never done the experiment on the East Coast. I will say that my Midwestern bias, I am from the Midwest. I teach in the Midwest. I work in the Midwest. I would expect this number to drop a little, because you guys are a little more tell it like it is. Uh, it was a mix of musicians and non-musicians, um, drawn from basically three populations, you can already guess. Computer scientists, <laughs> in, in, um, people, the, the student who was working with me with this was in the speech and hearing science department. So speech pathology students, so people with pretty good ears, and musicians. And it was about a third of each. Did you use one of the terms? Or we, for this, we did. We're going to move forward to ones where we did not supply the terms. The reason we were supplying the terms was because we wanted to have enough people all do the same thing so we could actually talk about it. For a particular word, are we getting satisfaction from a, a large number of people? So we had to force them to pick words. We literally occupied a computer lab and had a pizza party and got 35 people to show up and just did it that day. Um, then from that, we went ahead and said, OK, what if we were to put this in uh, a 2D space we did a little principal component analysis. And now each one of these is what I call a user concept. That is, a word taught to the machine by one person in one set training session. And we've color coded them. Muffled is green, tinny is blue, bright is yellow, warm is red, broad is black. And we tried to find uh, like some, some orientation that seemed good to sort of show us some stuff. And one of the things that we were learning from this is that the distribution, for example, of Tinny and bright, they kind of overlap each other in this set of people. And then tinny actually overlaps with muffled and bright, but bright and muffled tend not to overlap with each other. And so we did some work on this, and we published a paper about it with, a, with kind of a new interface that we were proposing for some commonly used words. Why don't we have an equalizer that is in terms of these words that we've been learning from a small group of people. And you just drag a dot over the word you want, and it gives you that audio effect. Now, how many people here are researchers who publish papers in conferences? Could you just raise your hand? Keep your hand up if anyone in industry has ever just read one of your papers and decided to make a thing. Yeah, OK. This is my one. <laughs> right? Literally. A guy read this paper from the company Tone Boosters, and he came up to me and he said, 
hey, um, I made this. Uh, is that OK? <laughs> and I was so excited. Of course, yes, just, just link back to our website. So they did. And, um, and this is a commercial thing. That, this one's free, actually. It's, with a, it's one of those shareware, you know, pay what you want kind of things. And so people generally don't pay. But, <laughs> but what, what we're getting here is uh, we, we actually published the paper. Someone read it and made a, and made a commercial, uh, commercially available or broadly available product. And it's downloadable. And that's great. And so here's an example of using that. Just as a reminder, how long do you think it would take you to do that with this interface? Even if you know how to work it. Ah. So this thing was released into the wild and started to get reviewed by real users on the website Gear Sluts, which <laughs> It is the name. It is, it is for audio equipment gearheads. <laughs> I don't know. But, but these are people who know how to work equalizers and who are the kind of person who already knows the complicated interface. And we were getting some really co cool things. Like the EZQ is what it was called. is really, really cool. I can't believe I tried it on an already good mix and it made it clearer and punchier. So it was really nice to hear from the people who actually use the complicated products that these simpler interfaces that we're working on are actually helping. Because one of the pieces of blowback that I've gotten more than once is you know, we submit this stuff to a, a, a conference, which is full of the people who have spent all that time learning the complicated interface. And part of their ego is tied up in having this high priesthood knowledge that the, the masses don't have. And they don't want to hear that we're going to hand this ability to people who haven't gone through the hazing ritual of learning these interfaces. So it's nice to hear from those in the wild that, that they like it. Well, I think in terms of music and audio generally, Andy, the graduate student working with me, thinks in terms of, well, he was getting his PhD in, in speech and uh, hearing science. And so he said, you know, I thought of another user population that might like to have something to change the audio quality of sound who really, really, really don't want to know how it works. They just want it to work. And that is hearing aid users. Because it turns out hearing aids are essentially, well, they're multiband compressors these days. And for the uninitiated, let's just say that's a fancy kind of equalizer. And for the initiated, I'm sorry for having made that terrible oversimplification. But um, could you do something like this with a multiband compressor with hearing aids? And a first step has already happened. I, I mentioned Andy started this company, Ear Machine. And with this interface, the one that we just showed you, the dark, tinny, bright, warm, and is working hard to commercialize fancier versions of it. So these interfaces that we started out talking about how to do this for musicians, for people who produce audio, which is really a small segment of the population. Uh, it turns out, upon reflection, there are other people in the world that have problems with these things. And those people are far more common. And, and we are going to help them. Now, one thing that you might say about this is, well, what if the sound I'm looking for isn't one of these four things? What then? Well, you go back to the original interface, the one with the uh, questions where we say, well, is this, is that, what do you think of this? It will get to it, but it takes some time. And so that turns out to be a little bit of an issue because not everyone wants to play 20 questions or perhaps 30 questions. What this is is the number of audio examples someone has to rate. And this measure is the machine tries to guess what you'll say about the next audio example it selects. So it tries to figure out, it's learning a model of you as you're going. And it says, OK, this next one, I bet, I bet Nicole's really going to like this one. And then if it's wrong, it's, oh, OK. So my ability to predict you wasn't as good as I thought. And so 
Right now, with this thing that I described, it kind of asymptotes in its ability to correctly predict your rating at about like this, around 0.7. Something I haven't shown you is that when we've done the clinical trials on, on people in the lab setting, it turns out if we repeat examples for you, so let's say in the actual early experiments, we would give you 75 examples you have to listen to, the catch being that, uh, or sometimes more, but the catch being that a large portion of them would be repeats to see whether you were consistent in your responses. And it turns out people generally tend to have about a 0.7 consistency. That is to say, if we did a Pearson's correlation on pairwise, we gave you the example, then 14 examples later, we gave it to you again, and what did you rate it as? There, it gets to predict you about as well as knowing what you answered the question last time will do in terms of predictiveness. We are describing the interface that existed before. You have, here we are on our website version of this, teach us a word. What happens now? It plays a sound. You do this. And this is how it's working. And so if you change your mind about this in light of further examples, you're free to move it. So yeah, that, that question actually came up. And this was the solution that we came up with. You can argue about this solution as well. For example, the vertical dimension is meaningless on that thing that you just saw. And uh, maybe we should have some meaning for it. OK, so what we've talked about is how can I, knowing nothing, learn the meaning of an, uh, of an adjective that describes sound like that an equalizer could manipulate? Then we talked about, well, I, having a vocabulary of four words, could I give you an interface that's better than the interface you're used to seeing? Um, well, I just noticed that the colors of my Anyway, um, now what we want to do is move beyond that. And we would like to be able to free it up and have you use whatever words you want, but not have to ask you 30 questions to figure out what that means. And one thing that we can do to make that happen is transfer learning, remembering what we were taught by someone else before. So these are equalization curves that two different users produced for different different words. And so here we go, bright, tinny, both from user one. Here's bright from user two. And one thing that I'll just mention is that these two, just qualitatively looking at them, look more like each other than these two, even though these two share a label. Okay, So one person thinks of this EQ setting that you would see here as tinny. Probably they don't like it. The other person is like, well, it's not bad. It's bright. It's not bad. And so we start to see a thing here where we have a distribution. And we saw that in the when we displayed the individual user concepts in that 2D space. We don't exactly tend to agree on the definition of any word, right? What does love mean to you? Uh, it, we have kind of a distribution of meaning. And so how do we deal with that distribution of meaning when we're trying to have something interact with us? OK. How can we use this person's prior data to help us learn this? And maybe we can't do the simplistic thing that you think of first and say, just hand them that person's bright, because maybe that's not as good as this. So what we do is the following. You have some sound. We manipulate it with different equalization curves. A variety of people have rated them in light of the word that they were trying to teach it. 
Okay, so here we have Sue teaching it warm, Jim teaching it dark, and Bob teaching it fat. Each person goes ahead and rates the examples. And now what we've got is an interesting thing here. We've got one example that's been rated by various people for various purposes. What good is that? Well, we're going to talk about that in a minute. What if, since I've only got a two-dimensional display surface here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about everything in sort of a 2D world, but you can imagine a higher dimensional world, I hope. So let's take somebody's concept, Sue's idea of what warm means. I'm going to take two examples that she's rated. Here's example two and example three, and she gave it a 0.8 and a negative 0.5. And we're going to take her concept warm and put it into, a, in this case, a 2D space whose coordinates are determined by what people rated various examples at. So this is your rating of example two. This is your rating of example three for that concept. And here we've got Sue's warm, Jim's dark, and Bob's fat. How is this going to help me? Let us say whoop, that I have a new concept. It could be anything. Brian's miedoso. That means fearful in one translation. But we'll see it might not always mean fearful in English. Um, so I've got some new concept here. Well, how do I put myself in that, my concept in that space? Well, it's simple. I ask. Brian to rate the two examples that everyone else has already rated. And given my responses, we put me in that space. Now, now we can figure out how much our knowledge of what other people have taught it can influence this new concept. It turns out, even though none of these words matched the new word I just came up with, one of them is a lot closer in terms of how someone responded to the questions we were asking. So you know, if we put this in political terms, do you want to call yourself a progressive or a liberal? Well, probably in the US, people who call themselves one or the other will answer questions about whether they want health care to be paid for by the government in a similar way. And so even though they've got different labels, you might be able to place them close to each other in a space in the political spectrum. So here's the same idea. Even though we've got different labels, I can figure out how much influence my knowledge learned from prior examples should influence my learning for the new example. OK, so then the question is, which questions to ask? Well, you want to ask a, div a divisive question. If we take a look at the variance in people's responses to the different examples played to them, one of these examples didn't show nearly as much variance as another. And this would be you know, a question of, let's say, again, I'm just using this political example. Uh, if the question that I put on my questionnaire was, what's your favorite flavor of ice cream, chocolate or vanilla? I'm guessing, I haven't done the research, but I'm guessing that it will probably be less correlated with political party than if I said, who's a better president, Barack Obama or Ronald Reagan? One of these things will bifurcate our groups in a way that we're looking for, and the other one probably won't. Here, what we're doing to figure out which examples to play first to put us in that coordinate space or figure out which ones separate different people's concepts. This is a kind of active learning. So the active learning is driving our transfer learning because what we're doing is we're figuring out what questions are good questions to ask to quickly home in without bothering the user too much on if I can just ask a couple of questions. Let me just ask this. Do you like chocolate ice cream and Barack Obama? Or do you like, you know, in this case, do you like this sound or that sound? And from this, we get our placement in the space. So what? 
So this is our baseline learning. Again, the ability to predict what you'll say to the next example I play you, how much you like it. Here it is with transfer learning when we can, when we actually have examples of the same word in our database. Here it is when we have no examples of the same word in our database. And this is on a logarithmic scale, so you have to pay attention to that. So actually, if we start out and you haven't answered any questions, uh, if, if we just have to guess the average of other, other, other sounds, we're going to do kind of badly. If we can make that average other sounds with the same label, we do much better. But we still do better than just the baseline, even in this case where we don't have the same label. OK, so what's that idea again? Instead of asking you to rate 30 examples to learn a word, we're going to ask you for maybe three-ish. We're going to use those ratings to locate your concept relative to known concepts. And then we're going to augment training by using the ratings from these already rated stuff weighted by distance. Now, the first thing that, the, how many people here know what collaborative filtering is? Yeah. So many people will go, oh, OK, so it's like collaborative filtering. You hand me the nearest word or whatever. And this is not exactly collaborative filtering because we do not use prior user data to pick an existing object for you. We use it in conjunction with your responses to build a new semi-personalized thing. So a new user concept is still placed in the space, and it's weighted by, excuse me, it's a combination of your responses and other people's past responses to things weighted by distance. And the more questions you feel like answering, the more we can home in on you. The less you feel like answering, the more it's going to be a general, well, other people who like bright sounds kind of went for this. So the goal here is to build a personalized controller tool that by asking you as few as three questions, boom, will give you the thing you need to manipulate the sound, whether that be in my case, thinking of a musician, like an acoustic musician who doesn't want to learn Pro Tools, but just wants to make, make that the sound of their vocals brighter, whatever brighter means. Well, that's an interesting question. The thing is, most people, you've, you've asked like this deep philosophical question. I want it to be brighter for other people. Most people kind of figure, well, if it looks bright to me, it's bright. And because they obviously have no way of doing once. If you want to do that for a large audience, then you kind of have to start doing um, samples of other people. And the kind of people I tend to work with as musicians don't have the kind of money to bring in focus groups. <laughs> that opens up that possibility now of being able to find out to what extent people are hearing the same song in the same way. Yes. And we're going to move forward towards something like that. Not quite there. You already saw that we've got something up on the web right now that asks you to teach us a word. Now, mind you, right now what's on the web is the full out experimental version, which you'll have to answer 40 questions because we're doing repeats and we're trying to get lots of baseline data. Why? Let's come back to this idea. Instead of 30 ratings, 30 ratings, ask for three. Use responses from data for prior concepts. Well, first, you have to have a database of prior concepts. If I don't have a big old database of words taught to me by hundreds or thousands of people, this thing won't fly because probably when you enter a word, it's like, I want it to sound more fat. No one will have taught it that, and we're back to the base case of having to ask you, well, is this fat? Is that fat? So what's on the web right now is socialeq.org, where we ask you, out of the goodness of your heart, to help us learn the meanings of adjectives that describe sound. And one of the things I've discovered is people are good-hearted. I learned this with our music search engine, where um, we're, we've asked people to fill our database with songs. Uh, the thing is, though, people are good-hearted when it's not a lot of work. <laughs> so sing, it's much, sing it's much more fun to sing a song. So when you teach TuneBot a song, 
You go in, you click, I'm teaching it this song, and then you sing Hey Jude or whatever it is you sing, and you're done. This takes a little time, maybe 10 minutes. Generally, the average person who clicks onto something on the, on the web, 10 minutes is a lifetime. So we do not get a lot of people, as we'd hoped, for the full experiment thing. So we did what all people do when our idea of a fun activity on the web that you're going to love and just give us data doesn't give us as much data as we'd hoped for. We turn to bribing people in a micro task market that some people have probably heard of called Mechanical Turk. This is a thing where people who are bored and need a little bit of money go on and find short jobs on the order of 10 minutes to get paid very small amounts of money to do the job. And so we posted, sorry? Uh, I guess it depends where they're living. <laughs> so the question was, do I pay them a living wage? And Depends how you live. You'll see what I pay them in just a moment. So we have, we can no longer get people from India. Mechanical Turk does not allow people to sign up who are not based in the United States, as I discovered when I was on sabbatical and trying to test our software from London. They wouldn't let me use it. Uh, so you had to get around that. But anyway, um, teach us a word has been posted on Mechanical Turk, and so has teach us a word in Spanish. People are paid a dollar to teach it a word. So if it takes you 10 minutes, then you're getting about six bucks an hour. And you can decide for yourself if you think that would be a living wage. And as I just mentioned, there's 40 rated examples for, per word. And 15 of these are, are repeats so that we can measure your consistency. So once we get your data, we have some inclusion criteria for the data. And the first one is, did you teach us a word that's in a dictionary? So unfortunately, that fat, P-H-A-T, wouldn't make this inclusion criterion and would be bounced, although we can expand that with slang dictionaries, urban dictionary. We haven't done that to date. We still keep the data, but for the stuff I'm going to show you, things that are you know, with a number eight in it or anything like that gets, gets bounced. We also ask them, are you listening on good speakers in a quiet room? Not everyone is. We are not going to show you that data, because if you're listening for sound quality, if someone is listening in a noisy room on, on speakers that are tinny to begin with, like their laptop speakers, their ability to distinguish, we've already done this study. We know they can't tell. So we get rid of those. We also get rid of people who took longer than one, or no, who took less than one minute to complete the task. Because generally, those are the people, there's always someone on Mechanical Turk who's trying to go, pay me. And so we need to do various things to deal with that. And one is, just take your time. And I mentioned consistency. We're not, any data that I'm going to display for you is going to be data where they showed a consistency, they repeated their response. And the consistency was at least within one standard deviation of the mean. So it could be more. But if you got below one standard deviation, below what the average person was doing in terms of consistency, this was more evidence that perhaps you didn't really tell us the truth about whether you were listening in a quiet room or you weren't really trying, even if you took longer. So as of Tuesday, which is yesterday, We've had 1,435 training sessions, out of which slightly over 1,000 have, have fit our criteria. And of these training sessions, 758 turned out to have a word that was in the English dictionary. 314 had a word that was in the Spanish dictionary. These represent this many distinct words. And of course, this means, on average, there's about three people teaching it, the same word in Spanish, and about two-ish in English. This is obviously not evenly distributed. It looks like it's following something like Zipf's Law. And this is how many people have contributed so far. You are, of course, busy, well-paid researchers with many other things to do. But if you would like to go on to Mechanical Turk and help us with this, we would be grateful. And you could earn a dollar. Actually, if you, you're really consistent, we even give you a bonus. So. OK, 
so here's a display of a portion of the space, and I just I kind of just picked a, a part of it that looked pleasing to me somehow, pleasing. And these are words, and the idea here is that the size of the word indicates how much agreement there was across multiple individuals who happen to have taught us that word. So sometimes if you've got a small word like this, all that really means is that it's only been taught to us by one person. If you've got a nice big word that means more than one person has taught us, and those people tended to agree in the, in the final definition of what that, that word was. So this is just kind of a visualization, just for you to see the kinds of words that are, that are appearing. We haven't, now you asked before, did we select the words? We did in the clinical trial. In this one, it's just you pick the word, you teach us anything you want, because we want to find out what words people would tend to choose, and we want to find out which ones tend to be manipulable by the audio tool that we're providing them. So there it is in Spanish. Again, this is, you can see here, this is calmado. It's just a portion of the space that I, for some reason, decided looked attractive to me, and so I grabbed it. Um, and you can see the kinds of words here that we're getting, and you know, some of them like piano. Now, that's an interesting one, right? Because one of the audio samples we provide is a piano. But for those of you who know what piano means, the piano forte means the soft, loud. So. I'm not sure what they're getting at with this one, honestly. And yeah, so aspero, frío, tranquilo, interesting. So let's, I, I talked about the word tinny before. This is just kind of, again, here they are put in, we did multi-dimensional scaling and threw them into a 2D display for you. So. Even though, I mean, there, there is some relation to how close things are from this, but it's, they're in a higher dimensional space, and it's not always as simple as that. But let's look at some stuff. One of the things we decided to do for, uh, for this, instead of just giving you a straight line like we did for a particular individual, what we've got here are distributions where the brighter it is, the more likely it is someone would, would say that you should set the EQ about like this at this frequency. So what we see here, here's the word tinny. Eight people have taught us tinny on our web version. And there's this sort of broad, cut the low frequencies, boost it up around 1,000 hertz, maybe another boost around seven or 8,000. You can see sort of a secondary kind of hump happening here. And these are actually distributions. We're showing you like slices of vertical uh, distributions of the uh, they're parameterized distributions, so we can get into the details, but I just want you to sort of see one. Here's another word, light. And for light, I'm getting this upward feeling, right? Now, coming from your visually dominated linguistic paradigm, would someone here like to give me what the opposite of light is? Dark? And this is the thing that we're finding for hard. Now, before we did that, like before yesterday, I didn't even realize hard was a word that people were using to describe EQ. I literally, you know, I work in this area. I had no idea. But we're getting a pretty good kind of angled thing here like this. And so now imagine you're an audiologist, right? And this person with a hearing aid comes to you and they say, yeah, so the hearing aid is sounding really hard. I wouldn't even know where to begin. <laughs> well, now I might. Because I could go to our tool here and say, what's, what, what's a hard sound? And they might be saying, oh, look, it's really boosted in the low ends, in the low frequencies. It's really loud. And in the high frequencies, it's, it's cutting off. OK. OK, does anyone here speak Spanish? I know you all speak English. Great. What is a Spanish, if you were going to translate the word chunky? We haven't gotten, we've only gotten two people teaching us e each of these. 
we're not sure yet. I mean, it's, it's provocative. It's not, you know, once we've got maybe 10 people teaching us each of these words, I'll feel more confident in saying this. But here's the curve we learned for chunky, which, by the way, it really shocks me that chunky showed such strong agreement across the, even the two people that did this. And here we have potente. In a million years, I never would have guessed, first of all, that chunky is a word people are using to describe sound and using in a way that is reproducible and understandable by another person. And two, that the translation, potente, is just what you think, strong, potent, that in Spanish, I might want to use that word. Well, no, like chunky, you know what chunky is. I'm a little chunky. I'm thinking like a texture of food. Chunk, another way to say chunky? Oh. But did you know this one? Uh, no. Yeah, me neither. That sounds surprising, though. That's nice. I mean, that's kind of how I feel about the last one, where it's like, okay, I can see like hard, light, like especially with weight. I don't know, hard to lift, so the high end is low? I, I, I don't know, but one of the things we're discovering is that if you look in dictionary definitions, they usually are dealing with the dominant visual paradigm, sometimes with touch, like soft. I would have expected soft might be the opposite of hard, but in audio, of course, we know it's soft and loud. And so when you look at dictionary definitions for words, a lot of times what you're going to get is something that's dominated by a different modality. So this opens up a possibility of translation per through perception. You compare the learned equalization curves, find in another language the word who's matched to an EQ curve that is most similar to the one that you found in your home language, and there you go. And now the thing is, these translations are different from those derived from the paired text. Oh, why is there a letter B there? And you know. I know I'm being videoed, <laughs> but here we go. It just, it's nagging at me. Saving. All right, got to restart it. They're different from those derived from paired text, and they, I think they might be better for audio description. And so just as sort of a taking a look at that, I picked some words here in Spanish. I gave you here, these are according to a certain uh, criterion of which, what's close, close words in English according to social EQ as based on measuring how similar their EQ curves are. Here are the words that Google Translate listed as common translations as opposed to other labels they give it like uncommon and rare. And just have a look. Now for this one, sharp, penetrating, acute, shrill, these are all good definitions. In fact, Google has as an uncommon translation, shrill, which is actually the top translation for our thing. Which makes sense because our thing is focused entirely on sound and sharp and penetrating. These are, you know, might be like sharp pain and acute pain. Um, they're looking at other modalities and audio sharp isn't, or I'm sorry, uh, shrill is in there, but I think it's like number seven. Suave, as in rico. So here we get soothing, calm, peaceful, soft, and here we've got some nice agreement, soft, gentle, sweet. Here's our potente to chunky, the one that you just looked at, where powerful and potent are the Google translations, which are the ones I would have said. A weird one that I didn't realize for Spanish, just like I didn't realize chunky was a word, miedoso, fearful. Now, I don't know about this translation, funky, but OK. But miedoso pretty strongly correlates to crisp, light, and bright. I would have never guessed that. So I think this, this is kind of an interesting thing. So we're collecting 
hundreds and hopefully we're going to get to thousands of, of words that have been contributed by thousands of people on the web. And we're learning what these adjectives mean in terms of real actionable changes to the audio that we can use to provide you tools like a language-based hearing aid interface. I'm finding the sound in here too hard. Can you help me, hearing aid? Or can you help me, audiologist? And the audiologist says, hang on, let me just look up what you might mean by that. Yeah, I gave you an example of that. Or, like as a musician, the music sounds chunky. How can I fix that? And the tool says, try the de-chunk knob. Perceptually grounded sound adjective dictionary translation tool. I already talked about that. You know, you've got that person that comes in who's primarily a Spanish speaker. You've got a really good Spanish speaking, but not native audiologist who's like, hmm. The only meaning I know for that sound, miedoso, the patient says the hearing aid sounds fearful. What on earth does that mean? Well, according to the social EQ database, it turns out there's some synonyms for that which include crisp and bright. That's something as an audiologist you can work with. Okay, so the punchline here is we're not rethinking sound interfaces. We're rethinking the interface, or we're teaching the interfaces to rethink themselves. They learn from you, they provide new tools based on what they learn from you, and ideally allow you to do things that you couldn't have done otherwise. I say we, those of you who work in academia know that professors tend to use the royal we. Um, there's always people in the background doing the heavy lifting that the professor is ideally avoiding. Um, Mark Cartwright, David Little, Zafar Rafi, and Andy Sabin have all done great things to contribute to this whole project as we've moved along. And of course, the NSF is funding it, so we have to thank them for all the great stuff they've done there. Um, that's the talk. I guess this is the point where I'd ask if there are any, any questions. Yes. Okay. And one of the hardest things to deal with is genre for a, a lot of reasons. For, for the recording, should they be talking onto a microphone? Should she say that again? Yes, sir. Oh. <laughs> okay. What is a music librarian? <laughs> I mean, it's a librarian who deals primarily with different kinds of music rather than different kinds of literature. I mean, like the CD rack in the library. The musical scores. I was actually a music librarian at MTV for several years. So. Wow, cool. And one of the things that was hard for us was to talk to different groups of people about um, genre. And uh, I was thinking about sort of like the way, so I'm thinking about that on the one hand, that difficulty of translation, and on the other hand, the difficulty or the sort of temptation to use algorithms to mediate. Like there, it's yeah. not my idea of punk rock and your idea of Riot Girl where that fits in. It's sort of like, oh, well, we'll just outsource it to the algorithm. So I was just curious if you had any like interest in, or if that was the thing that you were thinking about, is sort of like associating a sound with a genre. Like I can imagine that sort of being this like objective idea of like, well, enough people say that you know, uh, whatever, um, that, you know, dubstep is funky and it's also tinny, um, and so this track is like that, and therefore it's dubstep. And so I don't have to intervene with that, but I hate dubstep, and I don't want to. Well, I'll answer that in a couple of ways. I don't work on that because there are so many people already working on that. If you go to uh, the ISMIR, ISMIR.net, ISMIR.net, there's a conference, International Society of Music Information Retrieval, who one of their main themes is automatic genre recognition. And there are annual competitions on automatic genre recognition. And a lot of them have that same initial starting point of, well, let's just get it from the low level basic sound. And you can do that to a degree. But as you're already aware, um, what happens in one second or even 10 seconds might not be enough if you don't pay attention to other things. For example, what makes something a waltz? Well, it's in 3-4 time. 
what makes it a blues? Oh, well, it has a blues chord progression and it's played by Muddy Waters. Uh, what makes something a murder ballad? Well, the lyrics have to be about murder. So there's, there's some genres can be easily distinguished from each other in terms of this low level audio stuff. Like it's very easy to tell heavy metal from string quartet. But then if you said, okay, waltz or not waltz. Well, in fact, a heavy metal song could be in three, four and a string quartet could be playing something in three, four. And you have to listen to something longer and learn things about beats and stuff. So there's a lot in there, but the Izmir conference is where you want to look and, and a lot of people are interested. So, yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. Maybe I'm, just, I'm interested. To, I, I was at a conference in June at Oxford University about music and technology, uh -huh. and there were a number of people there who were talking about sort of audio equipment and sound. And one of the there was a really interesting paper about how a file with Skrillex songs in it made its way from the United States to Havana and how this DJ in Havana got it and he wanted to recreate the sound and he couldn't uh -huh. with the tools that he had. And it was, it was just a really close study of sort of the cultural innovations that happened around the efforts in the Cuban dance mm. mix scene to try to replicate this sound. And like I say, I don't know where that goes in terms of the question, but I'm kind of imagining this world where people go, it's not a problem. They just play Skrillex and it says, oh, you need to do this with the tool you've got, right? And on the, on the one hand, that's incredibly cool. On the other hand, uh, you feel something gets lost there. I don't know if I feel something gets lost. It, 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 I guess I'd like to hear your thoughts on innovation and invention and creativity. And I guess in a way that goes to sort of what Jess is getting at, too, of what is I can see the incredible utility of what you're talking about. I don't in any way mean to undermine it, but I'm, I can also see the engineer's reaction of sort of, wait a minute, this is an, an art and we have so much, I've got 30 years of being in the studio yeah. knowing what a singer means when he says, I want my voice to be dry and I, I know how to get dry you know, or whatnot. Or, so what does happen to that innovation? Does this free people up to do more innovations of other kind? Does it, how do you view what you do relative to okay. people's ability to create and innovate? I will give you three answers to that okay. because this is a question that's come up before. Uh -huh. The first one is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give the hard, the march of progress doesn't cease for anyone answer, which is, if you think about it, what I want to do when I'm cooking a meal is heat the food to a certain degree to achieve certain uh, effects of denaturing things and blah, 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 and so I have a beautiful fried egg. There, um, there is an art to fire starting. There is a far, an art to kindling. There is an art to doing all of these things that it took to make a fire, and there, there were people who were very good at it. But what happens is you're good at, at a particular level of technology, a level of tool, and, and you, the culture explores that, and then eventually someone comes up with a tool that allows you to bypass that step, such as the gas oven or, or many other things, the, the lighter. There's, no, there's nothing keeping us from going back to flint right now. But people generally prefer lighters because it turns out the thing they care about is not the art of fire starting. So that's the kind of like really pushy, your technology is going, you know, going away answer. But another, uh, another answer is there is nothing keeping you from using the existing set of tools. They are there. We are adding to your palette. Sometimes it will be meaningful and useful to use something uh, in the same way that a calculator is meaningful and useful to use. But I already know what 6 times 7 is. It's 42. I don't need a machine to tell me that. I learned my multiplication tables. When I see these kids today using a calculator to tell them that, <laughs> really? Come on. The culture moves forward and certain people decide to rely on that tool for something and free up that brain space to do another thing. Uh, that's answer two. And I'm gonna, am I going to be like Rick Perry and forget what the third answer was? Um, I think answer three is the following. and something we haven't yet done in the project. I want to do education. 
So if you, right now, coming back to this, let's say that someone says to me, I want to make it light. And I'm, and I'm thinking, I don't know what that means. And it shows me this. And now I can go to a certain tool and be like, OK, I'm going to do this. And in the future, I'm going to know to do this. And I don't have to consult the tool the second time because it taught me a word. That's great. We teach it words. The words can get taught back to other members of our society. And then they've got that knowledge, and they can move forward using the existing tools. If you, look, if you showed this to an audiologist, an audiologist could very quickly give you, or, or a musician, an engineer who's, who's used to equalizers, could very quickly give you that effect. Um, so I think in that there's going to be a group of people that don't necessarily want to understand the ins and outs of the existing knobs. We've got to win in, in terms of educating people who know how to work it but maybe don't know what you're talking about. We've got to win. And we're never stopping you from using the existing tool. And let me say one more thing about the existing tool. Let's come back and look at it, if I can ever get to it. Now, why does it look this way? Can any of you guess why it looks this way? Right. There used to be hardware. There used to be hardware. It was constrained by the kinds of things we could build in hardware, knobs. With little, they didn't even have these readouts. It just had knobs with notches around it, and you turned. And so now, when this software first got going, it went like this. We have professional engineers who have learned to use the existing knob-based hardware. You release a plug-in. Well, back in the day when these things first started, this piece of software would cost $500. No amateur is going to buy it. Only the professional engineers are going to buy it. So I better give them an interface, which is exactly like the one that they already know how to use. Because they don't want to learn. They've already, they already know what to do. So what happens is all sorts of design decisions that were made because of the constraints imposed on us by the hardware that we had available at the time become calcified in this software world where we can do anything. So I guess my last answer is we're trying to think about, well, now that we can do anything, what should we do? Let's try different kinds of interfaces, ones with words labeled on it or ones that, that are evaluation-based, where you just say whether you like it or you don't like it, and we give you something. Why be tied to this paradigm which was forced upon us by constraints which no longer exist? So that's my other thought on that. Uh, OK, so should we? It sounds like we should stop because there's food out there and people. Okay, yeah, I'll be happy to talk to you out there. So, thank you. Thank you.